It really is about perhaps the one remaining dirty word in America, and that is class. You know, we like to believe that we live in a classless society. But then when you look at the actual facts of the way that li lives are lived in America, it tends not to be true at all. Now, this was particularly true when Dreiser wrote his, the novel, Sister Carrie. He wrote it in 1905, it was set in 1900. And that was a time of enormous distinction between the classes. In this, we wanted to deal with the idea of class in America, women, the role of women and men, uh, the expectations for that, how you can be socially mobile or how you can't be. It's a combination of being able to do the small, very intense things with the characters and also the larger social things. The normal trajectory of an opera in, in, in the past has been the woman suffers all this abuse and then is killed commit suicide, you know, whatever, leads to bad fates. In this case, the men come to bad ends and the woman is triumphant. And so we thought, okay, two men writing about a woman and in inverting the normal archetype about uh, women in opera would be a, 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 an extra benefit to writing this story. I'm with my it's about a young girl from Waukesha, Wisconsin who um, makes the journey from there to Chicago and ultimately to New York. And the, the social barriers and labor barriers that are uniquely put up against women at the time this happened, at the turn of the century. It's a story that doesn't have necessarily any heroes and villains. It has people who are affected by society. So it's how societal norms at the tur turn of the century affect people and how they react to that. We watch her and, and witness uh, Carrie go from something like a Laura Ingalls Wilder figure and ending up like a Hello Dolly figure. And it really does happen before your eyes. <laughs> Carrie has two key relationships and really the latter could not happen without the former. And so the, the first is with Mr. Drouet. He is a, a boss at the factory where she's working and he sees a little something a little bit different in her. You belong in places like this or better than this. He sort of invites her out, out of that circumstance by saying, I can help you get along. I mean, we can be friendly, if you like. On their own, this will be your place. And by the way, this beautiful apartment is all for you. I won't you. I'm so grateful. Sister Carrie is not coming relationship with Drouet, she starts to experience more of society. And in one of those key moments, she encounters George Hurstwood. He's the, the manager at a resort restaurant. He has uh, charisma and he's magnetic. She's attracted and interested in his position and, and his standing but she's really also um, taken with him. Hurstwood, to a degree, has become fed up with the social climbing and the obsession with nicer and nicer things. It's one of the things that has become an issue in his marriage is that his wife, his wife is a social climber. He doesn't really have a solution for it. That's the problem is, is he just is going to try to find it in another person who seems less complicated. And I think that's what he sees in Carrie. He sees someone who's almost a clean slate. He re genuinely falls in love with her, and he sacrifices everything, his, every part of his social standing. And then he starts this kind of r remarkable and very, very sad decline. But I'll take anything now. He can't dig himself out of, out of this, this terrible depression that he's in. 
and eventually she has to leave him while she is becoming a, an ever more successful star. I'm going away. So really it's a, it's a love story about the two of them and as much as we've emphasized the importance of class, what makes it I think interesting is it's a genuine and very original love story between these two people set against this large and important social background. My character's name is Lola, and she is a chorus girl in New York City and meets Carrie there. She loves being on stage, but she's very content to be where she is. I think she's really happy to be in the chorus, happy to be part of an ensemble. She loves having fun. What looks beneath the captain? They kind of bring out the best in each other. They help each other see what each other's, well, at least Lola certainly helps Carrie see what some of her strengths are. She loves her fan mail, and there's a great duet between Carrie and Lola about that in the opera. Her success is not an unmitigated success. Her independence, her success, has come at a cost. And she has not only paid for that, but she'll continue to pay for that. The Florentine Opera is run by William Florescu. He's directing the, the opera, too. He knows the kind of singing, singing actors that we love to work with, and he's cast this opera just brilliantly. The two leads are really well known for, for being great singing actors, but also having a real way with new work. Adriana Zabala, who's been with us in more classical repertory, has done a number of new works, particularly with Minnesota opera. Keith Fairs, who's doing Hearst work. So Keith has a unique ability to create and, and sort of wrap himself around new roles. Lisa Jordheim, who's doing Lola, was a, a, was a former studio artist with us. And then Matt Morgan has just the right stage sense for, for the role of Drouet. It's a really great quartet of lead artists. We're storytellers. That's what we are, first and foremost, are storytellers. There's a lot in this story that is true to our lives as human beings in terms of the complexities and the nuances, the ups and the downs, and I think we want them to have a true experience. Oh.